the name of God, I, Samuel Richmond of Richmond's Falls, Raleigh County, Virginia, being of sound and discriminating mind, do make and ordain this to be my last will and testament, hereby revoking all others. To my son, Marshall H. Richmond, A formidable obstruction is the falls at Richmond's Mill. These are designated in the neighborhood as the Great Falls of the New River. At this place, the water may be said to fall perpendicularly 23 feet. For this distance, the sheet which dashes over the summit is intercepted only by huge fragments of broken rock, which, having been successfully disjoined from the brink of the precipice, have fallen into the foaming basin below, where, piled on each other, they form one or two benches that break the cataract. Justice John Marshall, 1812. On both sides of West Virginia's Interstate 64, the Appalachians stretch away. The slopes are green with sourwood, poplar, blossoming dogwoods, maple, oak, and wild cherry. A sweep of wilderness looking much as it must have looked a thousand years ago. On my left, without warning, a jagged chasm splits the rock. Far below, the new river pours through the gorge with a white roar. Whirlpools lashed with spume, eddying and racing away. Hypnotic, eerie, violent as the birth of time. East of Beckley, the road tilts into a breakneck descent, plunging toward the river. At the foot of the mountain lies sandstone. As I pull off the road and stop, I greet once again this stretch of West Virginia that has won my heart. Railroad tracks skirt the shore of the New River. The Richmond Farm is nestled along the opposite shore. I walk along, my mind filled with echoes and images, ghosts, of all those who have passed through sandstone. I was raised just a few miles up the road and remember so well the days of steam engines. 
My husband, Millard, grew up in a suffocating New Jersey factory city. Like so many young men during the Depression, he scrambled aboard a boxcar and rode that racketing flat wheeler south to the cry of its whistle, speaking adventures waiting somewhere out there. Along the tracks, I see the remnants of Sandstone's boom days when teams of horses and oxen brought logs to the sawmills and steam trains carried away lumber, farm products, and passengers. My grandmother used to take the milk the cows. I always had two or three cows here to milk. I've got the old cream can up there with my grandfather's name on it, where he shipped it to uh, on the train, you know, saying stuff. If you can see it or not, it says uh, J.P. Cooper Sandstone, West Virginia, Fairmont, and Columbus, uh, Columbus, Ohio. I remember there's about four stores. Sam Gillen's store, it was up on top of the hill from Sandstone. Simon Kell's store, Carl Cantrell's store, Jess Honecker's store, Bill Simmons' store, and then there's a cream station there. He had to carry cream, one of them big cream cans, take it down and have it tested. And then you put it on 13 passenger train and shipped it somewhere. I don't know where it went to. There used to be a, a CNO um, stop here and there used to be a taxi stand, there used to be a, a bus stand. And when the railroad comes through, there's all this virgin timber. And so the Honeckers have become very big in the timber industry and the milling industry at Sandstone. It becomes a very thriving community, then with general stores and ancillary businesses that supplied the timber industry. So it grew up into a, a thriving little village until the timber boom went and there was no more timber. Now right out in that area, Josh Honecker had a sawmill. Uh, of course, you'd probably see where the road come out down there. He had an old 37 truck. I'd get off from school and come up and clean the mill just to get a drive a truck. Of course, that was fine with Jess because he's getting work done for nothing, you know. And I come in that evening, told me to take it up on uh, Honecker Hill to his brother Harry. I told him, I said, Jess, I said, I can't drive that truck. He said, you drive a little one, don't you? I said, Jess. He said, well, he said, the gear shift's the same. I said, go ahead. I said, but I don't have license. He said, well, he said, uh, if you get caught, said just tell the law that you board the truck and I'll take it from there. So from there, I started driving, hauling logs and everything else for him. Eventually worked into a job, paying job with Jess. You know, Jess Honecker, Janice's dad, came over here and bought the timber back up in here. And they put the skidway in over here across the creek. And they brought the trucks in and pulled the logs down with the horse over there and they brought the trucks in and loaded them there in that creek and hauled them out of here. And we boarded each horse for him, my grandfather did. There's been a sawmill on sandstone from the beginning of, it was settled there, you know. I saw it down there for 20 years myself, not during these early years. In 1876, a poplar tree was cut on New River, which manufactured 4,150 feet of lumber. This is a sample of the character of timber that grows in this region. The timber was clear and sound. Judge James Miller.
Not far upriver is the battered old railroad town of Hinton, its train yard, roundhouse, switching tracks, and loading ramps are now deserted. But in the 1920s and 30s, boarding houses, bordellos, honky-tonks crowded the river's edge from Hinton to Sandstone, swarming with gandy dancers, brakemen, dispatchers, engineers, firemen, pickpockets, gamblers, shady ladies, and brimstone preachers, hoarsely exhorting them all to wash themselves in the blood of the Lamb. Anymore, we're so ashamed of God, we won't even raise a holy yeah. hand, and we're scared to witness of who Jesus Christ is. But I can tell you right now who He is. He become my partner. Hey, he become my father. He become my living Savior. He was the one that died. He was yes, the one that shed my, His blood. Him. And John said, "Hey, here He comes. I see Him walking down the shore, and He's coming to you hey, right my. today." In the recognition of God the Father, God the Son. God, he the Holy Spirit. If I survey all the good things that come to me far above, if I could count all the blessings from the storehouse of love, I'd simply ask for the favor of him beyond mortal man, I'm sure he granted again and again. I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all the troubles and heartaches are vanished away. And we'll enjoy all the beauty for all things are new, I want to stroll over heaven with you. As I walk along the tracks, I summon it up, see it all, hear the whoosh and roar of the fireball mail careening past. Gondolas loaded with coal, flat beds, loaded with timber, hobos, slouched in open box, car doorways, and I seem to hear the high lonesome wail of a ghost train whistling. The sound that meant freedom to so many of us caught in the grip of the depression. And there was all kinds of passenger trains. Just about all day long, you know, up until after dark. So all of them didn't stop at Sandstone. Just 13 and 14, and 5 and 6, and 7. And you'd go to Hinton for about 15 cents. And I'd go up and play a ball game and get on the train and come back. Not far from here is the Big Ben Tunnel where John Henry hammered out his legend, dying as he defeated the steam drill. Millard sang the homage to the railroad man when he was 20, honoring the link to the people here who strummed and sang out their lives.
to Miss Rosa Mullins, Brooks, West Virginia. Dearest friend, there will be a dance at Sandstone Friday night, April 4th. Be sure to come and tell the rest and try to bring a crowd. Wanda Richmond. West Virginia's woods have always been magical to me. These sandstone cliffs were a hunting ground for Native Americans. Iroquois, Algonquin, and Shawnee all hunted here, as did the Cherokee. I'm part Cherokee and proud of my heritage. Moving along the river, I call up the lean hunters on their shaggy ponies, watch them trap raccoon and possum, fire lightning swift arrows to bring down deer. I'm mindful of the tribal ways the respect for the wild creatures that furnish food and clothing. I see my ancestral children fishing for bass, gathering freshwater mussel along the bank. The Paleo Indians were the earliest people in the area. Those were nomadic hunter-gatherers. There were not many of those people. They lived in small bands. They had not formed into what we would call a tribe as they would go up in the summer in the uplands, hunt game, gather foods in the wintertime, come down here, gather nuts get uh, shellfish from the river, live down on these warmer, more sheltered areas. The archaic people lived in smaller, longer-term settlements. They started to do some agriculture, and by the time you had the woodland tribes, that were the tribes that were here basically when the European contact, year-round villages, very pretty extensive agriculture, corn, squash, beans, pottery making, burial mounds. We have archaeological evidence of all three of those areas, ages of people down here right through sandstone. The territory of which Summers County is included was originally a howling wilderness, inhabited no doubt by the ancient Indian tribes, and there are many evidences yet remaining in some parts of the county of the habitations of these people. Flints, arrowheads, stone tomahawks, and other stone implements are found scattered on and under the surface and are plowed up in the cultivation of the soil. Judge James Miller. Anywhere you look in this area, you're gonna find massive amount of artifacts, you know, going all of these different periods. You find a rock shelter anywhere in New River Gorge, anywhere in this area. If you looked for it, you'll probably some, some sign of native people had been there, hunting camp, chip of flint chips, bones from where they had at a cooking fire, you're going to find something. The farmer's fields, that's the best artifact hunters originally were the farmers. They were plowing these bottom lands. I'm sure the Richmonds came across all kinds of artifacts just in plowing and clearing their land down through here. In the year of 1730, there came to New River a gang of wild white men, and they had with them their red-headed wives. These individuals lived from hunting and fishing after the manner of the Indians. They lived under cliffs and in caves. The Adkins family of this area are descendants of this rugged tribe, Charles Andrew James. Mary Draper's Angles, uh, she made her way walking upriver uh, on the Raleigh County side, directly across from Sandstone, while she was following the river home uh, in 1755 to what today we call Blacksburg. One of the first permanent white settlers was a Revolutionary War veteran, William Cody Richmond, who staked his claim to the bottom land along the Great Falls on the New River. William Richmond, he came back in here, first one settled in here, he came from Union, Bogota. William Richmond came in here in the 1700s, uh, late 1700s, and settled down here on that old farm. Still got their original deed. Go down sheepskin, signed by James Rowe, the governor, and came president. Oh no, it's got it all covered up. It's just about a thing of the past, to be honest with you. Uh, that that glass thing got sprinkled all out. That helped that whole lot. Ain't too bad. See, it's uh, signed by James Monroe right there. Really? Yeah, James Monroe was governor of Virginia, became president of the United States. Where's that signature? Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. 
William Richmond, he had a son named uh, Samuel Richmond. And Samuel, he had a son named Alan Richmond. And Alan had my dad, Webster Richmond. Went down to generation to generation. Yeah. During the 1800s, uh, people used the power of the creek's water power in this county to the best advantage. The West Virginia powder mills were completed at New Richmond in 1877, and the manufactured product amounted to 600 pounds per day. The falls of Lick Creek, one half mile above its mouth, were utilized for water power. In the sandstone area, uh, grist mills were built on Laurel Creek and Lick Creek. Of course, the Richmond Mill at the falls uh, was the most productive since the water power was year-round and powered by New River. Only one mill survives intact today in Summers County, and that's Cooper's Mill, located uh, uh, on Little Blue Stone River. My great-great-grandfather, Josiah Cooper, uh, bought it in 1890, I'm sorry, 1883, and it was sold to his son, Thomas Moody Cooper, uh, who operated the mill uh, in, from then continuously until shortly before his death in 1945. Uh, I, I have seen it operate during those years several times. I wouldn't have found it in. The guy was, me and he was down there working and he said, what is it? And I said, it's a millstone. He, and I was telling him about it and he said, well, that's part of your history right there. And he helped me load the truck. That thing's heavy too. And usually at the grist mill, you would often have a post office, general store, tavern, of course. Everybody cuts their corn at the same time, just about. You bring it in, you got to wait in line. Uh, well, you got to pass the time. So some of them had places where you could lodge. Uh, it was a time to talk and socialize. It was a time to politic. It was a time to gossip. Uh, this is where you would have your broadsides and such. So they became very important social and cultural components of any society. I like to find the rest of it, I know that. We looked around and couldn't find it. Though. But it could have been buried in leaves and all that stuff right now. There's a hole right in here. That's where they locked it in or somewhere or another. One of them had a hole in it. The New River Country was visited by Chief Justice John Marshall, the great Chief Justice of the United States, with other commissioners who explored that stream in 1812. The report of these commissioners is a most interesting document. Judge James Miller. The Great Falls of New River must be turned by using the canal to cut on the southern side, pursuing nearly the track of Richmond's Mill Race. Should locks be employed, it will most probably be found advisable to place them in this canal. Should locks be dispensed with, there will be no difficulty in descending through this channel. But the toil of ascending must at this place be considerable. John Marshall. This, was, this river was the interstate back then. So, so the important people were focusing on it, trying to do something with it. The John Marshall Survey Party arrived at Richmond's Mill at the falls of the New River on September 29, 1812. We presume, as would have been the custom of the day, that they spent the night at the William Richmond Farmhouse, having supper with the family, conversing. John Marshall and William Richmond were both Revolutionary War veterans, and William would have been really interested in Marshall's vision of a major trade route to the west that passed right through the Richmond property. We find it really interesting that Samuel, who was 11 years old at the time, grew up, married Sarah Caperton, and named the first child Marshall, presumably after John Marshall, since we have not found that name in the Richmond or Caperton families. Here at the mouth of Laurel Creek, the Richmond family crossed the river not once, but thousands of times, running the ferry for five long generations. The wooden boats we used to have, they used to be twice the size. You could carry a thousand pounds in them easy. These little boats here, just a rocky they can be, made on nothing. 
I already carry a couple people in. But we never did use a boat like this at no time for a ferry or anything. We always had wooden boats, big wooden boats. But most of people crossed, it was on Saturday. Come across, get their groceries, mail and stuff. And um, there was a lot of people over on the Raleigh side then, back up in the mountains. And they would come down and hitch their horses to the hitching post over there. And they'd bring them across the river and they'd go to the store, you know, in the post office. And then when they got ready to go, they'd just go back up to the creek and holler. And somebody from the Richmond family would come over and get them. Webster and Richmond used to run a ferry across here. And us kids, when we was kids, we'd get out here, and get a bunch of snowballs together, you know. And uh, Webster would say, uh, boys, Give me two strokes of the oar and throw all you want to. We give him two strokes of the oar, he's out of our distance. We, we couldn't hit him at all. But we had a big rail along there where people would tie the horses up, eat people back out of the mountains, the Irish Mountain. There's a lot of people living on the Irish Mountain. Everybody had horses. Everybody had horses. There wasn't no tractors. And we charged them 10 cents a piece to go over, 10 cents back. and. Uh, they come over here and they have a sled or wagon or some of them just rode the old horse off the mountain. And they put stuff on the saddle right there and get in the old saddle and ride back up on the mountain. They probably take them an hour, get, an hour and a half, get back up on top. But it was basically an all day trip for them. And, uh, but as time went on, it, it all came to an end. You just come out here and they usually watch. You come out here and holler or wave at him. What long, he'll be right over here to get you, you know. Right here is boat landing. The boat landing used to it wasn't like this. It was uh, it was real way out in the water right there, real uh, gradual slope. You could back a horse and wagon down there and load right out of a boat right onto it, pull up out of here. But it's all washed out now. And get worse all the time. When people hewed up ties, cross ties, pull the wagon, the horses up on the thing, and take them over sandstone and they sold them away. And tandem bark was a big thing too. Wagons of tandem bark. And I remember a, a family of Gwens that lived down the river here below where the uh, interstate is now, and they came across every day to school. They went to school at Sandstone. They were in Raleigh County, but all they had to do was come across the river and they were right there. And back when my dad was a young man, and uh, his dad, they had a big old flat bottom barge uh, that they could drive a team and a wagon up on and uh, they could take the team and the wagon across, and it was pulled across, you'd pull it, push it across the river from one side to the other. But back in 1940, just before they built the dam, last big flood took it off, and uh, it went down the river, and they never did build, build them one. The river has given, but it has also taken, asserting its wild nature. A highly destructive flash flood hit New River communities without any warning August of 1940. We stood on Jess Taylor's porch and watched the stuff go down the river. The livestock and everything, you know, it, it just washed everything away. Of course, the trains come up at night and uh, blowed the horn, woke everybody up, and you could hear the popping and the cracking of trees and stuff. And the water was so high that they rode, uh, rode the boat right on top of the barbed wire fences and rode over toward the hillside. And, uh, Stay down until the flood water went down. Uh, daybreak, you can see houses washing down the uh, river and everything else, you know. They was, they was in boats getting around, going into the store. And Bill Simmons' store down on the lower end. And the uh, water run through the windows of the house that I live in now. Mother brought us up there to see it. It was devastating. And my uncle, he never did leave the house. He was uh, he was sitting out on the porch and water was up to his knees sitting on a chair and when the water went down, uh, he was sitting there asleep. He was real old, he was still sitting there asleep. He wasn't about to leave, uh, leave, the, uh, leave the old farm place. Old man John Ames had that down in the, what they call the drift. He had 500 white legger chickens and uh, he had a team of horses and several cows. He had his cattle and horses and mules down there washed all them away. He lost uh, all his chickens but one. I think as one got up on top of the tree, he saved it. Found one of his horses uh, called Old Pearl. Uh, 
down around Prince somewhere, and one of these hogs, I think, down around there. And other than that, he lost about everything. About a week later, Franklin Roosevelt passed through on a train on his way to the Greenbrier Hotel. He was serving his second term as president and was running for a third. The train stopped for 10 minutes of Hinton. Roosevelt was eating lunch. People could see him through the train window. His secretary of the interior came to the back of the train and let the crowd of 2,500 people know that the president supported funding for the Bluestone Dam. Civil War came and Virginia was torn apart. The community itself split in violent conflict. My mind still catches the glimpses of the blue and gray uniforms as the armies from both sides crossed the misty river. October 14, 1861. After seven or eight miles march over the roughest country yet seen of hills, mountains, muddy swamps, Along the banks of the rockiest creek perhaps that exists, we are encamped at Green Sulphur Springs, hemmed in on all sides by high crag mountains. Friday the 18th, moved on a road along the winding narrow pike on the side of the mountains, over precipices a hundred feet below, awful and fright to behold. And to the opposite side is the mountain, rising majestically as far above, this is a picture of the country for seven miles to the New River, where we are now waiting for the flat to carry us across. Two o'clock all across. Now waiting for the baggage trains which come one at a time. Took a stroll up the river along a narrow road between the bluff and the river. Bluff of solid stone from 70 to 100 feet in perpendicular height. On the left, the river a solid stone bed, 300 yards wide. The water falling in a solid column the whole width of the river, abruptly lashing and foaming among the broken fragments of granite below, making a striking contrast with the waters above as they glided smoothly and listlessly along, like the sweets of human life when the soul is happy. Private Cyrus Jenkins, Company B, 13th George Infantry. On the 19th of April, 1862, 100 soldiers left Raleigh Courthouse for Richmond Ferry on the New River. After crossing several swollen streams, the detachment reached the ferry and the officers quartered in the house of Mr. Samuel Richmond. This family has suffered much from their undoubted proclivities to the Union cause. The old man kept the officers up late, relating the adventures of himself, his daughter Sally, and his son, Devil Bill. Your mama don't like you coming out with me like this. But... I think I can take care of myself. With the gorillas and bushwhackers. For weeks at a time, himself and son had remained oh, hid in the mountains, and his daughter, Sally, brought them food. The daughter had sustained the fighting reputation of the family by joining her father and friends a few days before when attacked by bushwhackers, and with a double barrel shotgun, fired away with great zeal. I reckon I could fire on tarnal bushwhackers as well as Ari and you and The old man pointed with pride to several holes in the door and windows as he carelessly remarked. Few marks of the siege, sir. 30th Ohio Regimental History. To my daughter, Sally Richmond, I hereby bequeath 100 acres of land lying at the head of the Fall Branch in Raleigh County, Virginia. I also give her $300 in money be paid out of my interest and debts when collected. I have already given her a bay mayor now at my house. My grandpa, Alan Richmond, fought in the Civil War, and his dad was Samuel, but being my great grandpa, he was killed during the Civil War across the river. He was bushwhacked. And, uh, Nobody around here has any slaves to them, out, and their boys should be farming instead of being off fighting. Be careful. I got a bad feeling. Oh, dear Sally, 
I'm just taking Alan over. He did a fine job fixing the mill and he needs to get home. I'll be right on back. Have your wits about you. I just will. Yeah, look up. Be quiet. Yeah, Samuel, you're getting on in years. I reckon you collected enough nickels off this here ferry to sit back for a while and let me be your fucking mother. Can't do that. Your success friends over there would rough you up working for me. Yeah, you got a point there. Some of those fellows was pretty riled up with all that union talk we were doing at the store the other day. My daddy fought a war to make this country. And they just want to take it apart. I will speak what I think. This here rebellion is nothing but a bloody mess, just like I said from the start. Talk like that's what's got them all riled up over here on this side of the river. I sure do appreciate the work. You do good work, Alan Vincent. If you're ever back in this area, come around. I have Sally fix up one of them roosters for you. All right. You take care of yourself. The date of the shooting of Samuel Richmond was September 11, 1863. This has always been understood as a cold-blooded and unprovoked murder, done in the heat of partisan passion. When the woods were full of bushwhackers ready at any moment when they believed the interest of their partisan size demanded to commit cruel, unnecessary destruction of human life. Judge James Miller. Uh, the way I understood it, he took a friend across the river the other side, and he was on his way back to this side, and he was ambushed. And he, he managed to make it to the, to the bank. He was shot through the lung. And he managed to make it to the bank, and his boys carried him from the house, from the boat up to the house, and uh, he died. And so I said it was right here where we're sitting. Yeah, I said right here where it was at. After the war, Tuck Richmond, who was Samuel Richmond's son, took his revenge and assassinated Jefferson Bennett. The most prominent of the various stories is that they were having a big celebration on New River to celebrate the close of the war. Jefferson Bennett and his family had gotten up and was getting ready to go. His wife was making breakfast, and he was uh, under an apple tree getting, getting ready to shave, and he was chewing tobacco when the raiders rode up. And Hey, Jefferson Bennett! Tuck Richmond was one of them, and he fired at Jefferson Bennett, uh, apparently without any warning, and shot him immediately, and his dog ran up, and they shot his dog, and Sal, uh, Nancy and, and the children ran into the woods. Later, Jefferson Bennett's son, Lou Bennett, died in 1930. He was five years old, or maybe six, when his daddy was murdered. And he went after Tuck Richmond when he became a man. And it's said that he caught Tuck Richmond on a boat out in the river fishing, and he just beat the hell out of him. To my two sons, Alan Richmond and Alexander Tuck Richmond, I leave the home track at the mill of 331 acres, also the island adjoining of 10 acres, and also a track of 1,973 acres of land. I also bequeath to them a horse apiece with saddle and bridle. With this proviso, that my well-beloved wife Sally shall have and shall enjoy during her lifetime the mill 
and the home tract with all the profits arising therefrom. I also direct that the death of my wife, all of my household and kitchen furniture shall go to Allen and Tuck. I also bequeath to Allen and Tuck by carpenters, blacksmith, and farming tools of every description. In the fall of 1867, I was asked by the Post Office Department to go through the lower counties of West Virginia to report upon the needs of mail service. The department, having been unable to get anyone to make the trip, I accordingly went by rail to Covington and then bought a horse for the journey. I went to Lewisburg and started from there into what was then a wilderness. I stayed at Lewisburg overnight and the postmaster tried to dissuade me from attempting the journey, saying that the country was unsafe, that the feuds between Union men and Confederates were still alive, and that people were being assassinated almost daily. Some man will pick you off with a squirrel rifle for plunder, said the sheriff. However, I had no trouble whatever on the journey, but there were many interesting incidents. There were no wagon roads in any of the counties that I rode through, but there were bridle paths. There were small valleys that were cultivated and occasionally rude mills where corn could be ground. There were no sawmills, whip saws being used for the little lumber required in the building of houses, and even the courthouses were built of logs. Almost every person I met asked how the price of sang was doing. It finally got through my head that it was ginseng almost the only product that brought any money into the country. There was an abundance of magnificent timber, which has since been utilized, so I suppose today it is very wealthy. I heard stories of people, Union and Confederate, being gunned down. I took dinner with a man who told me he had been a Confederate, and later told me I must not try to stop at Richmond's Falls, but must make my way to Gwynn's Green Sulphur Springs and gave the Richmonds a bad name, saying it would not be safe to stay there. I gathered the reason for his prejudice. I reached the hillside at Richmond's Falls on the New River just before dark. The house was a large, low structure with an open space in the middle, which was roofed and floored. And I took a seat there. Tubs of apples were standing around, and I took an apple to eat from one of the tubs. An elderly woman with a very strong face, a large frame, her coarse hair unkempt, her bare arms and her throat showing great strength with meal covering her dress, showing that she worked at the little mill by the falls, appeared and said, What are you doing here? I stopped to stay the night. We ain't staying here. We don't keep nobody, not since the war. Best get on your horse and get along. I met a man up on the mountain told me to come by here and wait for him. That's my son. He don't run this place, I do. And I say you ain't staying. So get on your horse and get along. I suppose you won't have me because I'm a Yankee. Hmm. You a Yankee? Yes, I'm a Yankee. I'm a northern man and I'm working on government business. Not after moonshiners? No, I'm with the post office department. Hmm. Them apples you've eaten ain't no good. Here, try one of these. She handed me some beautiful big apples, and I knew the trouble was over. I could hear chickens squawking as they were being killed, and every provision was made for my entertainment. I helped establish the post office there called Rich Man's Falls, in the county of Raleigh on the route between Table Rock and Green Sulphur Springs. Mrs. Richmond's son John assumed the responsibility of postmaster. To my son, John A. Richmond, I have given 205 acres of land in Greenbrier County on New River just below the mouth of Lick Creek and also 36 acres of land adjoining. Both tracts have been deeded to him. This is all of my estate that he will get. It was on the 20th of January, 1874, that the famous fistfight occurred between John A. Richmond and Thomas Bragg at New Richmond. They fell out over some trespassing hogs. They were two of the most powerful men physically in Summers County. 
After fighting for some time, Richmond got Bragg down and made him holler, ENOUGH! Richmond was a merchant at the mouth of Lick Creek. Bragg was a farmer residing on the Hump Mountain. After the fight was over, and as was the fashion in those days, they shook hands and made friends, and they remained so afterwards. Judge James Miller. John A. Richmond, the fifth son of Samuel, was a man of excellent natural sense and ability, and was a man of fine personal appearance. His opportunities for education were limited, but he was a successful businessman throughout his career. He was one of the first postmasters appointed in that part of the county, the name of the post office at that time being Richmond's Falls, afterwards changed to New Richmond in 1871. He retained the office of postmaster without change until his death on March 1, 1901, at the age of 68 years. His widow, Mrs. P.S. Richmond, succeeded him as postmistress, Judge James Miller. The Richmonds owned a lot of property here in Sandstone, and they asked my dad to move up in the old home place, which was the old Richmond log house. It was about uh, 60 feet long and had a porch on both front and back. There was four logs underneath it that held it up on stone that uh, was the full length of the building. I can remember real well playing under it, you know. And the logs was daubed with uh, mud. Uh, six foot far places, you could put a six foot long log in. And uh, I remember they, they had a hook around and it swung out. You cooked your beans and cooked your meals, and us kids would, when it would get cold weather, would stand and uh, warm one side and freeze the other, you know. <laughs> and then we'd turn around and freeze that side and warm the other. And uh, that's just the way it was back then. Post office records show that the post office uh, name was uh, changed from New Richmond to Sandstone in April uh, of 1910. The town uh, by then was uh, referred to as Sandstone. It's a railroad depot was called Sandstone since sometime in the uh, 1890s. On the sides of the mountain and down in the hollows, my family and our neighbors carved a living out of the rocky soil on our mountain homesteads. From mother to daughter, from father to son, our parents passed along the skills we needed to survive. It was just, uh, it was just hard times, and we thought it was a good time. We didn't have sense enough to know we was having a hard time, because everybody had live the same way. And if you run out of some like salt or sugar, you went to your neighbor and borrow it. And when you got a chance to go to the store, you'd pay them back. And it's just rough living. You dug what, what you eat, you dug it out of the ground and canned and butchered. And if you didn't, you didn't have nothing to eat. You know, it was rough on you. And bed bugs like to eat us up. So, of course, we had to burn the mattresses and sprayed kerosene on the springs and, and lit them enough to burn uh, anything, eggs off of it, you know. Paint the wall, the floors, fumigate the place. And uh, that way we didn't have a mattress to sleep on. So uh, we go get straw. Uh, got uh, material made straw tick. And st us kids, uh, they stuffed them uh, straw ticks, and us kids jump up and down on you know, break that straw up and get them sleepable and slept on them till. Uh, finally, uh, mom and dad got enough feathers to make a feather tick in their bed. Us kids slept on the straw ticks until we finally got where we could get a mattress to sleep on, you know. Back then, you had to take care of stuff. And uh, 
It, in the summertime, all the quilts had to be washed. And they would fix a big tub of hot water, and they would put them quilts, one quilt at a time, down in that tub of hot water. And of course, we'd have to have our feet washed good, and we'd get in them tubs and tramp them quilts, and then tramp them a while, and they'd turn them over, you know, and we'd tramp them some more, and that's why you got your quilts washed back then. Well, Dr. Stokes used to come down across the river in a boat and go up on top of Forest Mountain here, yeah. rode a horse on top of the mountain, delivered babies on top of the mountain up in there. Anyone got sick, they always come down across the river and back to Hinton that way. Yeah. It was a rough life, but it's the only way he could because he didn't have no road down in here or nothing. I can remember Webster Richmond bringing a team of horses and a wagon across that river on ice. Now that's how cold it got back then. People complain now about ice and snow and cold. It got cold back then. You know, it had to. The river froze over back then. It would freeze uh, 18 inches deep. Jeff Hodder, he would... Uh, had an old 37 Chevrolet pickup, and I saw him load that thing down with everything and go, and go on it and drive right across that ice. Uh, I sure wouldn't have done it, but he did. And uh, then eventually he built a ice house down there behind his store. And uh, well, as I remember, it was uh, six inches thick, you know, at the wall boards on the outside and on the inside and uh, before he put the top on it he filled in between the sawdust uh, of course he run that mill down there had plenty of sawdust and uh, when the river freeze like that he'd go out there and cut that ice in chunks and put it in that uh, ice house and have ice all summer long <laughs> one evening about it was two o'clock and big drops of snow started coming down Teacher told everybody it was barefooted that they'd go home. So everybody was barefooted. And uh, by the time we got home, the snow was above our ankles. And we pay, we didn't pay any attention to it. Just, just, we just didn't let things like that bother us. I know the old home place, the old Richmond place caught on fire one night. And, uh, Everybody in town just come running with a bucket. And the thrash machine traveled from farm to farm, and the men, the men all went with it. Uh, and then the women went from farm to farm cooking. While the men was thrashing, the women was cooking. So that's the way they got their work done, you know, together. I make my way down river to Meadow Creek a sleepy cluster of houses where my friend Elmer Richmond used to live. An old railroad man, he spent his whole life within a few miles of here. Even into his 90s, he was a spry, jaunty beekeeper, basket maker, arrowhead collector, deadpan teller of tall tales and mountain jokes. Finally, I stopped by the National Park Service Visitors Center at Sandstone. The modern building sits on the site of the old rock quarry where workers cut sandstone for the construction of railroad. The fine quarry at New Richmond was being operated at that place on the lands of J.A. Richmond, 50 men being engaged in the labor of getting out the stone in 18. The West Virginia Stone in the National Monument in Washington City is a block of sandstone secured from Richmond's quarry at New Richmond. It was sent on the 2nd of February, 1885. It is placed in the monument more than 200 feet above the ground, and it is two by four feet in dimensions. This site later became the home of the old sandstone school which served the community for 75 years.
Richmond Farm and Sandstone Falls area is basically the gateway to the New River Gorge. The park begins in Hinton. The park's 55 miles long from Hinton to Fayetteville, but really the New River Gorge starts to form right below Sandstone Falls. The, air, the river starts to narrow. The gorge becomes much more rugged. So this was really the last viable settlement area before you got down into the main part of the New River Gorge. All the old timers back in these mountains died off that went across the river. Everybody got automobiles, so nobody goes across the river no more. So that ended that. Now I still got a brother that lives down there. He goes across the river and gets his mail. My oldest brother, Holbert. I know. But outside of that, Holbert's the only one that goes across that river anymore. <clears throat> and after he dies, I guess we'll push the boat off, let it go on down the river. <laughs> Sunset spills fire across the new river. The woods awaiting dusk are dense and mysterious. For a fleeting moment, I stand motionless, listening to the ghost train whistle, hearing the throb of a Cherokee drum. Shaking off the spell, I bid Sandstone, the lovers, goodbye. I see. 